in society. And uh, so starting in 2016 with the, the, the center that I started, you know, I've been talking AI. Um, and I started doing this work in 2014 because I met a really interesting uh, computer scientist named Milan Tambe. And he was interested in some surprisingly similar issues that I was interested in, which was really how uh, influence processes happen in social networks. And I was really interested in them from a social science, behavioral science, understanding risk for homeless youth perspective, and in terms of designing interventions that might leverage those processes. And he was really interested in computational modeling and doing um, uh, doing models where he could understand how influence processes might work across large graphs and all this stuff. And so we started chatting and, and, and found that we had a lot of things in common. And, and a couple of years down the road, you know, flush with a successful pilot study, we decided to start this, this center. And so, um, okay, so killer robots, right? This is not what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it's funny, when I first in 2016 started talking about AI and social work, people thought I was completely insane. It was like I had said to somebody like, hey, you know what would be a really great idea is if you put maple syrup on top of sardines. And they were just looking at me like, that sounds disgusting. And uh, it turns out, I think, you know, the analogy I like to make is it's kind of like bacon wrapped dates. Um, AI and, and, and social work or data science and social work is like an unexpected combination, but it's actually really awesome and really and really delicious. Um, and once you get a taste of it, you're like, oh, I got to keep doing this. Um, so what kind of technology are we talking about if we're not talking about the Terminator, right? So we're, I'm definitely not talking about the singularity and other dystopic science fiction. I'm talking about things that are really kind of boring, right, um, and mundane, but actually are part of our daily lives. So one of the things that we're talking about is predictive analytics, okay? I think probably the example of predictive analytics that we all use all the time is Google. Right. So when you type in a search, Google guesses intelligently what you are looking for before you finish typing that string. Right. And Google learns from past data. It learns from massive amounts of data. And basically, it's just making a guess. It's predicting. It's saying, I think Eric is looking for the phrase, what is artificial intelligence? And, you know, and and notice that this is actually a screenshot of my of my searching because I do this kind of stuff and this you know it's a good guess because that is what I was looking for okay now I'm actually interested in the work that I've done um, in what Eric Horwitz of uh, Microsoft Research calls prescriptive analytics so instead of just guessing what might go on can we use AI tools to actually help us to make decisions more intelligently, especially around problems that use a lot of data and are very complex and which humans might be able to solve, but it takes us a very long time to solve these problems. And so what am I talking about? Okay, so here's two examples of prescriptive analytics that you use in your daily life. And probably the fact that I live in Los Angeles is reflected by these two choices because I think about cars a lot. Um, so we don't have subways that are worth a damn in, 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 uh, in LA. We, have, we, do, we do have a sunny day, not an icy day out there right now, but uh, we're stuck in our cars if we want to get any place. So one prescriptive analytic that I use all the time is uh, Google Maps, right? I'm at LAX. I'm trying to get to USC campus to get back to work after having gone on a trip. This is all clearly a slide that I came up with pre-pandemic. Um, and uh, we are thinking about, you know, what, so there's predictive analytics that are, that are undergirding this, right? So it is making some guesses about how long it will take me to get to campus via a series of different routes based on data mining past, uh, past data and looking at how that compares to current conditions. But it's also prescribing rec a recommendation. Right? It's saying, look, you should take this, this, this one route that's going to be 39 minutes over these other two routes, but it's a decision aid, right? Like ultimately for me as the, as the driver, I could say, oh, you know, I hate that route. That's the 39 minute route because I always end up, you know, in this one park that I, I just don't like dealing with, you know, those particular turns. I'd rather be on the highway for a longer period of time, not surface streets. And even though it's going to take me five extra minutes, that's fine. So that's the route I'm going to take. Great. Another predictive prescriptive analytic that you might think about. And in this, let me pause for just a second. 
This first example is really what I'm going to be talking about when I'm talking about my HIV prevention work. It's, it's, it's very sort of, I guess, metaphorically akin to this one, right? And then the, the second study that I'm going to be talking about where we're looking at housing interventions and we're matching people who are in need of housing to particular housing interventions is actually, you can think of it as being analogous to something like, like Uber, right? And so with Uber, you've got a system where you've got a sort of a supply side and a demand side. So instead of housing and, and, uh, and homeless individuals, housing units and homeless individuals, what we've got is we've got riders and drivers. And we're trying to optimize across the entire system so that we can satisfy as many people and maximize the, the success and efficiency of that whole system. And so um, this is the sort of thing that I think is really exciting and, and a place where computer scientists are fabulous collaborators because if you as a social work researcher and scientist can come up with the problem and specify the problem it, with a great enough um, clarity, the computer science colleagues can often help you think about how to mathematically model that problem and come up with um, solutions that might be uh, potentially more efficient and more um, and more effective than you could if you were simply trying to do this on on your own with sort of um, without the complexity of, 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 of AI helping you out. And so that really kind of gets me to sort of how do I, and this will be my last sort of preamble bit of talk here, which is, you know, how do I envision social work and data science coming together? Well, I actually think of it as a three-way collaboration. It's not just social work academics and uh, data science academics, but it's actually a three-way uh, partnership that also involves community, right? Social work, good intervention work in social work, good even research that's policy and practice driven in social work always involves the community, right? And this work is no exception. And, every, and, and you know, I think that all three of these stakeholder groups have a different role to play in the, the, the crafting and execution of these problems that we can tackle in these novel ways. And this is not a strict uh, assignment of roles. You know, there's some flexibility in this for sure, but in general, I tend to think of it like this, like the data science comes to us with the computational methods, right? The community tends to come to us with data sets, right? Administrative data sets, data they've, you know, collected, um, you know, in some other context, you know, um, but often it's administrative for social work. They come to us with problems, right? Like we've got a lot of people who are homeless, we need to house them, um, can we do this better, right? And they also come to you with client voice, which can include also, you know, the providers themselves and often does. Then what does the social work researcher bring? Well, the social work researcher actually brings a lot, right? And I think that this is the thing that sometimes social work researchers don't realize and which is why I'm so excited about this center that you've created because I think that what social work researchers bring is an understanding of interventions, different interventions, an understanding of social theory, how does human behavior actually work. We understand social context. Yes, community also understands social context, but we have a bird's eye view of social problems that is not quite so grounded in the day-to-day -day grind of a particular social service agency and the particular problems that they're seeing, right? We tend to have a little bit of ability to sort of step back and see the, the, the broader picture at times. And the other thing that we have, which is critical, is we understand the complexities of data. Data scientists, in my experience, understand the complexities of modeling, but often don't understand the complexities of data. They don't know where the bias is coming from. They don't know, they, they tend to treat, um, at least initially, until you work with them to, to, to work on this better. And I don't mean any, any disrespect to my data science colleagues who, who know that I, I love and respect them, but I am often the one who's telling them, how messy the collection of this data was, what sorts of errors are introduced by the human process of these data, and how to sort of make our way through these data. I mean, um, and it and it is, and that is an invaluable piece of the piece of the puzzle. So there's places around the table for everyone, and we all bring a unique set of skills, a unique set of technical knowledge, and and really it, I think it's um, you know, it's a collaboration across these things that makes stuff happen. 
All right, so let me get into it then, right? So let me give you a couple examples of how this of how this happens to, to try to give you a sense of what, what I'm talking about. So it's not just uh, you know, me sort of talking in these big general generalized abstractions, right? So homeless uh, youth, for those of you who don't know a lot about adolescents experiencing homelessness, it's a huge problem in the United States. There's about 4 million young people between the ages of 12 and 24 who experience homelessness for at least one night each year. Turns out one in 10 18 to 24 year olds experiences a night of homelessness each year. It's really, it's a staggering problem. Los Angeles, um, I mean, I know New York homelessness is really bad, but in Los Angeles, homelessness is crazy bad. Um, and the last time that we did a point in time count in Los Angeles County was 2020, just before the pandemic hit. And what we found was that 66,000 total people were experiencing homelessness on the streets or in emergency shelters. And 4,600 of those were, were young people between 12 and 24. The vast majority were 18 to 24 year olds. And to make matters worse, all kinds of problems around mental health, substance abuse, suicide, violence, and HIV are dramatically uh, uh, increased when young people experience homelessness. And there's health disparities, you know, galore that need to be dealt with with this pro with this population. And one of the issues that I've been working on for a very long time is, is HIV prevention. Seven percent of youth in Los Angeles in a study that I did in 2016, self-reported having HIV. That's compared to 0.3% is the prevalence in the general population of housed youth. So the, the disparity is, is, is enormous. Anything over 3%, the CDC considers an epidemic. So this, this population is wildly impacted. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on for God, 15 years at least now, has been thinking about social network-driven prevention programs for homeless youth. And we often refer to these as peer leader models or peer change agent um, models. And the idea here is that one method for HIV prevention that can be effective is to train a small group of people within a target population to become advocates for health promotion in their community. And then they will talk to their friends who might talk to their friends who might talk to their friends and spread uh, information and norm changing messages around HIV prevention into that population that needs it. Why might this be such a good thing for homeless youth is really that homeless youth are very disconnected from positive adults. A lot of homeless youth, about half of them have been in the foster care system, about a third of them have been in the juvenile justice system, about 40% are LGBT youth who've either been thrown out or have run away from dysfunctional families where they feel unwelcome. Um, there's an enormous amount of reasons why these young people don't trust adults and they rely on one another to survive day to day. And um, so the idea as a, you know, a good social work interventionist is, hey, how can we leverage this existing uh, social process as opposed to trying to force fit something to this population? Instead, let's infuse a, you know, a social process with something uh, positive. And in this case, it would be with HIV prevention messages into this, uh, so this diffusion process. Well, turns out that you know some of these peer leader models work and some of them don't when they're tested with different populations and there's been a lot of debate about why they work sometimes and why they don't work other times but in the last I'd say seven eight years one of the the discussions that's really come up is that the peer leaders themselves are the secret sauce right so if you have the right people that you that you train up your intervention is going to work. And if you have the wrong people that you train up, your intervention is going to flop. Or at least this is one of the theories that had been proposed. And, and I and some other folks have been kind of writing about this and tinkering or tinkering around with this, this idea about the peers as the secret sauce. And one thing that you can think about with this is what is their reach into the community, right? And so one way that you might think about this is how can we pick the structurally advantageous young people so that they can, so that we can quickly and efficiently disseminate these messages throughout these networks, right? And so if our network is relatively small, like the one that I'm picturing here, the decisions maybe aren't that hard. So I'm gonna pull my, my little cursor here. Like if we were thinking about these people here in the middle, 
you know, this person might be a good, a good choice because they can reach this group and this group. So this is a, a bridging person. Maybe that's a great idea. Or alternatively, maybe if we were picking two people, we might pick somebody from this group who's well connected and somebody from this group who's well connected. Or alternatively, we might just think, hey, we just want to have as many people as possible impacted by this intervention. And so why don't we just pick the people that have the most connections? And in fact, that's how this model had often been talked about. It was talked about as the popular opinion leader model, which basically, if you think about that, popularity means you have a lot of friends. So one way of thinking about this is just the people that have the most connections are, are the folks to go with. OK, well, what happens if your network looks like this? This is actually a real world social network of homeless youth in Los Angeles that I collected back in 2013 when I started working on this intervention design problem with, with Milan Tambe, the computer scientist I mentioned, who I started this center with several years ago. So I was showing him this, this network and I was saying, look, man, like this network is crazy. This network has, you know, a hundred has hundreds of youth, it's got hundreds of connections. And to make matters worse, we're not even sure that all of these network connections are necessarily real because the way that we can collect these network data, there's uncertainty because not every young person knows, you know, the full name of the, the people that they're connected to and relationships on the streets break up, you know, over, you know, resource sharing that goes awry, you know, new friendships are formed, you know, there's a lot of churn in who's in and out of the network space. So, you know, this is a this is a very, very, very messy social context in, you know, in which to think about who's the right person to be structurally advantageous. So when he and I started talking about this, we started talking about, well, how could computer science potentially help us to, you know, work on this problem. So what I was saying to him was, look, what I'm interested in as an intervention designer is to really select the most influential youth. And can we do better than the status quo of these interventions where essentially usually what we do is one of a couple of things. We either go out and ethnographically observe who talks to a lot of people and pick those people, or we give surveys to the population and say, you know, Who's, who's, who, who, do you, who do you look up to? Who would you like to have as, as, this, uh, as, as your peer leader? So again, it's like, you know, people that, you know, the more people that you connect to, the more likely you are to get picked in, in these ways. And I was thinking to myself, like, can, can we do better than that somehow? And, and they said, well, yeah, we have this whole line of research around, uh, around social influence uh, maximization in the context of social networks, a lot of which was done based on Twitter data. And, and, and he, they became really interested in what I was proposing because, a, it was a real world context where we were going to run some actual, you know, HIV prevention interventions on a problem that meant something. It wasn't just, you know, who's who's sharing things on Twitter, but also the fact that these networks were uncertain added a whole complexity to the computer science that they got super excited about. And one of the things that I want to share with you here is that social work, oftentimes what we think about is if there are things which are uncertain, we just have to say, well, we got to do the best we can. Um, and, and we'll sort of make some decisions where we kind of artificially decide that things are more stable than they, than they really are. Like, this is the network data that we can collect, so let's treat it as ground truth. Whereas in computer science, you can oftentimes model things as probabilistic. So we can say, hey, Eric's got these networks that he's, that he's given us, but he's got some added information about which of those connections he's not so sure about, and also some, some possibilities of connections that that, that might not even be represented here. And we can actually model, you know, thousands of possibilities of networks, not just one possibility of networks. So it gets, it gets way more complicated computationally, but it also gets way more realistic in terms of what we think about the, as the world, as we understand it, as social work researchers, and interventionists, which is really an exciting thing to do. So this here is how a computer scientist describes a algorithm. Um, if this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, that's totally okay. It took me a long time to, to, to get to get on this. But one thing that I will mention here that's kind of cool about the way that they solved this problem was they actually took the graph, uh, which is the network in, in computer science talk, and broke it into smaller subgraphs. So basically found the subcommunities that in that graph, if you remember, there are some different colors. Those are the cliques that existed within that, and then found people who were influential within each of those cliques, and that was part of the solution uh, that they came up with. But then what they did, which is really a cool thing for us as intervention designers, 
is that they're able to run computational experiments before we ever hit the real world. You know, doing an intervention trial in the real world, even a pilot study, takes months and thousands of dollars of resources and time of students and investigators. It's not something we enter into lightly. However, what computer scientists can do is they can run computational experiments and these hypothetical simulation type uh, models, and they can just help us understand how their proposed solutions compare to other solutions. So DC is degree centrality. This is network speak for most popular. Uh, the high, and I won't even get into why that means most popular, but just trust me that it means most popular. And I gave them two different networks, first graph and second graph. One was in Hollywood, one was in Venice Beach. And they ran um, degree centrality, which is the, this sort of peach color versus two different network uh, uh, solutions that they came up with in, in our early days of research and showed me that both of their solutions were better than the network solution. And so I was like, great, you've come up with a, a thing that's more efficient. Awesome. Well, if in the computational experiments, it's more efficient, let's see if that works in the real world. So then after we had a solution that seemed like it was viable, we went out and tested it in the real world. And so we did this study where we did the two versions and versus degree centrality. And we did it with about 50 young people in each of these uh, three networks that we tested this. It took us, honestly, this actually took us about 18 months because we needed to let the networks um, essentially, uh, they're unstable enough that are attached to these drop-in centers that I was working with that you go, you do the work, six months later, it's a different group of young people that are there. So you can go and do the work again. Six months later, it's a different group of young people that are there. You can go and do the work again. So, you know, this, this is not a short and quick and dirty uh, process. This is, this, is a, this is a time consuming process. But what we found was that if you looked at one after, after a month of the, the peer leaders being out in the world talking to their, to their network members, that the diffusion of information was much greater uh, in, in this. So we thought, okay, great, this is, this is good. This is good. Maybe we should think about doing a real trial where we actually see if it has impact on HIV outcomes, et cetera. But in the meantime, what we found out was there was a new problem that needed to be solved. And this is one of the fun things about the iterative process of this intervention design is that we discovered that we had a huge implementation problem waiting for us which was that collecting this network data was really time consuming. Even when we did only you know, small trials of like 50 young people, my MSW interns had to go out and interview every single one of those 50 young people about who their friends were, who were in the network space. And then we had to painstakingly stitch together a network diagram of all 50 of those people and how they were interconnected to one another. And this actually is, probably a process that we cannot expect an agency to do down the road who's going to adopt this HIV prevention intervention if we can show that it's a good intervention because it's just too time consuming. And we thought early on that we were going to be able to use Facebook and an app that we had built that extracted their network ties. But by the time we actually got to doing the work in 2016-17, we learned to our chagrin that Facebook was not cool. Facebook was something that old people used and that young people used Instagram and Snapchat. This is pre TikTok days. Um, and so we were sunk because the kinds of network, uh, those network platforms that they were actually using to communicate with one another don't allow you to actually create apps that could scrape network data from them. So we had to do network data collection the old fashioned way, which is to ask people who they're connected to, which is time consuming. So enter, oh, I should mention, I have a bunch of little thumbnails of my friends, so PhD students and uh, and and uh, professors who are colleagues of mine that helped me do this work. So this is work that Milan Tambe and, and Emilia Yadav originally did. Tambe is now at Harvard. Yadav is now at Penn State. Brian Wilder was a PhD student uh, of ours at the time. Um, uh, he's now a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon, which is like one of the top schools of. Uh, you know, computer science in, in, in the world, in part because of this work that he did here. Um, it's made him a very famous uh, 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 young uh, uh, academic, it's, uh, which is pretty gratifying to see in the, in the field of, uh, of AI. And so what he came up with was this very clever algorithm that allows us to randomly sample a small number of people and interview them about their social networks, their social network ties, in fact, it's one in 10 people that we that we talk to and then randomly sample 
somebody from their set of network ties and interview them. So in the end, we only had to interview one in five people, not everybody, which meant instead of having to interview, say, 100 young people, we had to inter we had to interview like 20 young people, which suddenly became something we thought, well, an agency could potentially do this if they really thought that this was a, a good idea. And what Brian then showed was that this algorithm that created this sketch of a social network was actually almost as good as the networks that depend the algorithms that depended on the full network data so healer and dosum were the names of the first two uh, uh that we tried out and change is the is the one that uses this clever network sampling uh idea which now we're talk talking not only about how can we optimize parts of an intervention like how can we get the best young people with the biggest reach that could get to our to more pop people but we're also talking about how can we use ai to augment implementation science i mean the the possibilities for social work to work in this space are are amazing anyway so again computational experiments showed that it worked almost as well real world experiments showed it actually worked just as well so we said awesome so let's do it so enter the full scale trial my community partners, safe place for youth, my friend's place in the LA LGBT Center. And, um, and we did this trial with 713 homeless young people over the course of about two, a little bit more than two years. And what we and we had three arms to our study. We had the popularity arm, degree centrality. We had our AI augmented arm, which was Brian's clever change algorithm. And then we had the observation only, just treatment as usual in the agencies to compare those two. And um, this is actually a picture of my first two social work interns who were leading the uh, the training sessions to train the peer leaders. These are actually three of the very first peer leaders that worked uh, in our in our program with us. And what did we do? Well, we um, and I have to have a big thanks to Dr. Robin Petering, who some of you may may know. Um, she helped me to actually build out the the actual. Uh, intervention training that goes as part of this in, uh, intervention. And we did a half day training with these two MSW co-facilitators. The training components focused on um, uh, a number of things, uh, training their peer advocacy mission, teaching them about HIV and STI uh, education, communication skills building, leadership skills building, and self-care. We then followed up with them once a week for seven weeks for between a half an hour and an hour, where we basically did sort of problem solving therapy type work, where we reviewed what they'd done for the week, applauded their successes, brainstormed and role played, how to you know, you know, overcome the challenges that they faced, and then set goals for the following week, and encouraged them to talk to their friends and their social contacts in person, not to talk to strangers, minimal work over social media, and to really um, you know, communicate about the importance of HIV testing, condom use, uh, improve knowledge in their population. And what we found was that it worked. You know, we had reductions in both in, anal, in unprotected anal sex and in unprotected vaginal sex um, in both arms, but, the, but it happened faster. Notice the, the acceleration there um, uh, in the AI arm relative. And what we found was when we did the, the full statistical models that AI over time for condomless anal sex was statistically significant, whereas uh, degree centrality wasn't. Um, it also is almost significant, uh, but not quite. It's 0.08 for the vaginal sex. And we also had some interesting findings about, you know, the impact of the pure change agents over time, you know, kind of regardless of which uh, condition they were in, that their HIV knowledge increased and their HIV testing increased, which, you know, it's just kind of nice social work re results, even though it doesn't say, hey, AI is, is augmenting things. Okay, so so it's great. AI can help us augment uh, behavioral health interventions. Oh, sweet. Let's let's think about more ways that we can do that. And I hope that you'll be inspired for that. Okay. So the last ten minutes, I'm going to talk about problem number two, which is front and center for the CNM Silver Center, um, race equity in LA County, and AI, and data science and AI. So this huge population of, of folks in Los Angeles are experiencing homelessness. Nine percent of them are black. Uh, in sorry, let me rephrase that. In Los Angeles, 9% of the population is Black, 40% of our population uh, of homeless individuals is Black. There's a huge race disparity that needs to be dealt with. Turns out, LA and many other cities, I've got, I've got data from across the country, actually, 
um, are fair and equitable in their allocation of resources. So uh, the, how, the population of folks who are housed in permanent supportive housing was 44% of the population that was housed that way was black, 40% of the population of uh, folks uh, who are experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles is black. Great, looks good so far. Outcomes are not equitable. This is the bad news. The rates of returns to homelessness for black people is twice that of white people, okay? This is the problem we're trying to solve for. Okay, so how do we enter this? We enter this through uh, assessment tools for vulnerability and how those assessment tools for vulnerability are then used to prioritize people for permanent supportive housing resources and rapid rehousing resources. So I actually did some work uh, several years ago to, with, along with OrgCode to help design these triage tools for, for homeless youth. And that's why I'm gonna do some data with, with youth again here. So the simplistic way that, that these, so that you get a score between zero and 17 based on, it's a predictive risk model, based on how, how, risk, how, how vulnerable are you. And before we had data to do some data mining um, to look at what would be the most efficient allocation of resources based on scores, there was just, ORCODE made some guesses. They said, hey, if you score eight or higher, you, we're, we're going to assign you to permanent supportive housing, or that's our recommendation. Four to seven, which is in the middle of this vulnerability range, you're going to get moderate intensity services, which is what we refer to usually as rapid rehousing, which is a, um, a time-limited rental subsidy. And if you score zero to three, we're going to give you uh, diversion services, which is sort of limited uh, support services. Okay, so I've got this data set of 11,000 homeless youth that was collected between 2015 and 2017 from 16 different communities across the country. And what you can see here is the housing outcomes that these young people had. So about almost a third got rapid rehousing, um, about, uh, about you know 7% got permanent support housing. It's a very expensive, very precious resource. A lot of people are still pending on the streets or are unknown, so they're probably pending on the streets. Some people went back to family, some people uh, self-resolved, meaning they got their own apartment. Okay, so what happened? Well, the, one of the things is that the allocation of resources in these communities is relatively akin to what the recommendations would be. So you can see here that eights and higher are getting the P permanent supportive housing resources as suggested by the scoring boxes you just saw. Um, four through uh, eight, or in this case, five through nine is what's recommended. And so what you see here is that actually people with eights and nines are being, uh, are being allocated um, uh, permanent supportive housing resources, uh, sorry, rapid rehousing resources, even though they're in that permanent supportive housing resource band, probably because those communities had more people scoring eight and nine that they wanted to serve and not enough rapid and not enough permanent supportive housing. So they gave them rapid rehousing. Okay. If you didn't get one of these resources, like you're one of those folks who tried to self-resolve or you, or you went back home, the higher your score, the more likely you were to return to homelessness. So this is one thing to bear in mind. Here are some of my collaborators that helped me do this, this data work. But the good news is if you got one of these resources, the chances are you did really well. So just like this slide I showed a few minutes ago about Los Angeles where you know, 90 plus percent of folks in general who get PSH uh, are, are, are staying, you know, are not returning to homelessness. Same, same with the, these youth data. But um, we want to see if we can make that, those outcomes more fair because the outcome that I showed you um, with, with um, here where the rates to return to homelessness are higher for Black people, this actually carries through across this data set with youth as well, okay? This is not unique to Los Angeles. All right, so enter Phoebe Vianos, uh, my uh, computer science colleague uh, at Viterbi, the Viterbi School of Engineering, who is who does a lot of work on policy optimization, and she is interested in um, how do we match housing to uh, youth in a, not only in a efficient way, but in a fair way. So this data science project involves uh, an algorithm that use, uses data at two stages of this algorithm. The first is in this machine learning module that she calls it. So first we're trying to learn from past data, what makes for a good match? Like what are the characteristics of people who tend to do well in permanent supportive housing, who tend to do well in rapid rehousing. 
And then we want to learn the probability that a youth with a given characteristics will exit homelessness if they're given one of those interventions, right? So this is a really important piece of predictive analytics, okay? Predictive risk modeling, you know, who, who's gonna benefit from this resource and what's the probability of that benefit? Then what we wanna do is we want to create a system that maximizes the returns to our investment. So what we want to do is we want to house as many people as we can in the best places for them that we can, but we want to make sure that we do this fairly. Okay. How does that play out? Well, I'm going to show you how that plays out with this, with this uh, graph here, and then, I'll, and then I'll explain how it plays out in a minute in the last couple minutes. Status quo with the data. What we see here is that Black youth are not doing as well as white youth in the actual data that we that we collect, that we that we got access to. The status quo of the system is actually a little less biased. So the actual policy recommendation from org code would be a little less biased, but it's still biased. First come, first serve. So just who arrives in the system the soonest would actually make things much worse in terms of race equity. And unfortunately, if we just only use a predictive analytic around how do we maximize our returns to investment, meaning how do we, if we just assign people to the housing intervention that would be the best serve. So if we use machine learning in a out of the box way without making modifications to it to address race equity, we actually make things worse. So this optimal policy that they design, that, they, that, we, can, that we can design is actually more disadvantageous to Black individuals. But because we as social work researchers said, hey, we need to solve for making a system that is fair, not just a system that is efficient, what they were able to do was to create a system that is housing a, you know, a large number of people. The probability of, of, of staying stably housed is very great. And we're able to largely reduce the race disparities. And so this is really kind of the ideal situation, right? So we're not just, so sometimes people talk about data science as having a lot of creation of bias. And yes, data science done thoughtlessly can create bias. And that's what we see here with this optimal policy. But data science can also create systems that are fair if that is in fact part of what they're trying to solve for, which is really exciting. Um, so for the sake of transparency, we wanted to design a system, and this will be the last thing I talk about, that um, wherein we could actually explain where these decisions come from. And so the original system, basically, if you scored less than, if you scored three or zero, th three or lower, you got SO. So that would be, uh, it would look like just a bar with SO. And then if you scored between four and four and four and seven, you got RRH. And if you scored eight or higher, you got PSH. Well, here, if you score eight or higher, you could get PSH or RRH is what this means. And this is what the optimal policy, this was the unfair policy. This is what it looks like. Much more complicated is the fair policy, but it is a fair policy and it's one that we can explain. So solid lines mean that everyone from this group gets this resource. So anyone who scores less than six is going to be assigned to um, uh, services, can be assigned to services only, or services only draws from black, white, and others for people that score less than six. However, if the dotted lines refer to just that group in this scoring range. So if you are white and you score between six and seven, you might be assigned services only. But if you score between six and seven, rapid rehousing can draw from white, black, and others in this, in this context. It can draw, rapid rehousing can draw from eights and nines. And in some cases, rapid rehousing can also draw from people that score greater than nine. So one of the thing, one of the ways that this solution works is that it says, hey, not everybody that scores eight or higher needs permanent supportive housing. We can actually serve a lot of those folks well with the less intense resource, which is part of how we can, we can maximize the system. But then permanent supportive housing if you score greater than nine, whites, black, or other um, can get assigned to PSH. But part of how we address the race inequity issue is that in some instances, black individuals who score less than nine are assigned permanent supportive housing. And even if they're scoring six and seven, they're assigned permanent supportive housing. It seems like there's something about permanent supportive housing that seems to serve black clients 
well and maybe better than rapid rehousing in some of these score ranges, which is part of how the solution works. So what we're doing now that we've done all these computational experiments is we're actually working with the Los Angeles Housing Service Authority. We have a three-year grant that's funded by the Hilton Foundation. And we are working with them to actually uh, work with the community to um, redesign these tools and pilot test these solutions. So if you're interested in this work, lots of papers on optimization for HIV prevention, lots of papers on housing equity. Um, I can share the slides uh, after, or you can send me an email um, and I would be more than happy to send you papers. I think I will stop sharing my screen right now so I can take some questions. I know I talk fast. I covered a lot of ground. I'm excited to engage in a conversation, such as one can on Zoom. Great, thank you. Well, I think this has obviously given people a lot to think about. So um, we have questions coming in. in Paris. So I've just kind of, some of the questions overlap. So I'll just kind of pick and choose. So um, from Moyatu Banya, who is in the, in the PhD program, she says, thank you for sharing this important information. And I'm truly fascinated by how this would apply to some of my research with girls living in urban areas in post-conflict African cities. Mm. Are there ethical issues that come up? If so, what are they? And what are some of the opportunities and drawbacks that come up in the usage of AI, particularly with this population at the intersection of data science and social work. And there are definitely quite a few questions sort of trying to get to these ethical issues. Sure, sure, sure. The ethical issues are, 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 are really uh, interesting um, and complicated. Uh, so I think one of the biggest areas of ethics that my uh, center and my colleagues and myself, like especially Phoebe Vianos, who I mentioned, she's a she's a assistant professor in computer science and, and industrial and systems engineering. She and I talk a lot about issues of fairness, bias, equity, and transparency, right? So, you know, when we think about ethical issues from the standpoint of research, all of these things still apply. Like, you know, we want to beneficence, you know, we want to do no harm. We want to make things better than, than, than they were before we got in there. But with the context of data science, you add in some really important considerations, especially around equity. So um, like I showed with that one, uh, you know, graph toward the end, you know, if you just use data science to maximize the impact of a particular outcome, but you don't think about how your data set may in fact be biased towards a particular group, like say race bias or sexual orientation bias or gender bias, um, you are, quite likely going to replicate the biases that exist in those data with the machine learning system that is making predictions from those data. However, this is where the role of social work is so important because we often are very aware of the equity issues at play in a particular setting and can be very thoughtful with the data science partners about how to uh, um, attack head on the equity issues. So looking into can, you know, are there actually race equity issues within these data? And it turns out, yes, there are. Then, okay, now that we've identified that, let's make sure that we design optim you know, problems where, you know, solutions where we're trying to make predictions and optimization around solutions where we're accounting for race and race equity so that we make a system that is in fact helping to solve the ethical problem, not exacerbating the ethical problem. I think the other issue that's really important here is transparency. You know, there are a number of AI techniques, especially convolutional neural network uh, modeling, that are what even computer scientists refer to as black box solutions. So you have a data that enters into this algorithm and you have a prediction that's made on the other side of the algorithm. But the computer scientists themselves can't tell you why a particular individual is picked to have a particular prediction. They can only tell you whether or not that prediction is accurate or not. And to me, that is not a particularly satisfying solution when you're talking about interventions that are life and death interventions, right? So you can't tell a uh, somebody who is experiencing homelessness that you're not getting permanent supportive housing because the computer said so. That's not an, that's not an acceptable answer. 
you need to provide them with some sort of interpretable answer. And so Phoebe and her students are working on those complex diagrams, right? And we're trying to still work out like, how do we talk about those diagrams in ways that are more, that are more approachable? But we know why people with scores of six who are white don't get permanent supportive housing, but why you might, if you're a person who's black, score six and get permanent supportive housing. It's not a black box. There's actually an explanation that can be given. And, and that's much more desirable to our community partners because they wanna know why people are getting resources. I mean, the current system, while it may not be perfect and it has some certainly some race bias that we wanna address, you know, you score this, you score this, you get that resource. You score that, you get that resource. Like it's, it's understandable, it's interpretable, it's transparent. And so that's another ethical issue that's kind of unique to data science and social work interventions that we don't really think about from like an IRB standpoint necessarily, but it's really important. Um, so I'll maybe stop there and take up more questions because I could talk about that one issue for the next 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so a couple of questions. Um sort of uh, focusing on structural factors. So I'll read mm -hmm. the question. So how does the predictive tool account for structural factors, i.e. racism, which we know is contributing to disproportionate outcomes? And if I understand correctly, I don't understand how a predictive tool can lead to more equitable outcomes given the variance explained is likely in part due to structural factors. Sure. Um, I, I, I appreciate this, that, that question. I mean, I think that this is something that, that, has, that, has, that has certainly been, been, been raised, right? So part of how we do these computational experiments is that we, um, we hold aside some of the data, uh, we learn from some of the data and we use some of the data to be, a, to be the testing data set as opposed to having new people enter and then and then see what happens and then and then we use the you know we use the the predictive model or the or the or the optimization algorithm whatever it is that you're interested in to then uh, use that that data and see, and see you know what would happen hypothetically if, if we did if we did this so part of what happens is that there is struck part of the um, so when we do these computational experiments, we are looking at real data in hypothetical ways to see what would happen if we did things differently than how they were than how they were done. So that's part of part of the the the, the how of the method, but part of how we address the idea that some aspects of structural racism are not seen is that. Um, you know, we know that there are what we refer to as unobserved confounding variables right so we can't model necessarily the racist landlords, right? Because we don't have them in our data set. Um, that doesn't mean that we cannot use the data and try to make assignments that are um, where we are trying to, to the best that we can make predictions. So this is part of the sort of the stochastic aspects of the, of the world that we can't necessarily model. And, and it's not necessarily a reason not to try to design superior uh, decision-making choices, but certainly as we collect better and better and better data that is more and more comprehensive, our accuracy will increase, right? So we might not have a particular, we might have a solution that given the data that we have can perform more fairly, but we're still making a guess, but at least, but we know the system that we currently have is shit. It is unfair, it is racist, and we could, and so let's try to do something that's better. Is it going to be perfect? No, but hopefully it's an improvement. So, I mean, that's maybe not the world's most satisfying answer. Like what you'd love to hear is that like AI can perform some magic and like make it so that you don't, you can have all these unobserved confounders, but it, it can't do that. So there's part of this is, and this is another place where social work really is an important partner in this is that we need to help people understand how to collect more of the right data, right? And so, um, you know, as with any computer program, you know, you, the old adage of garbage in, garbage out, right? So if we give it garbage data in the, in the input phase, we're going to have garbage in the output phase. And so this is a really reasonable um, ask, I think, of us as a field to get more and more data that captures more and more of these um, structural factors. But I think that we should also not 
wait for perfect data. So I think that perfection can be the enemy of progress sometimes. And so we, my suggestion is take what you've got on hand, be as honest and ethical about what's going on with it as you possibly can, make some decisions to do the best that you can to address the problems that you can. But part of that process should think about this as iterative and that you can identify problems that you would then look to try to collect better data on so you can have better solutions moving forward. So there's kind of a, there, how, how's that for an, an, an equivocating academic answer to a tough question? Uh, you know, I, 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 I love it. It's the right question to ask. I wish that there was a magic bullet answer for it, but there's not. Um, maybe we have time for one more. Um, yeah, I, I think we're, we are running out of time, but if, if, if people want to, yes. Um, yeah, so we had a couple of questions about thinking more broadly about prevention work and mm -hmm. what are some of your ideas about how AI data science can inform and maybe more clinical work, I think people were. Yeah, yeah so, so I, think, I think one of the things to think about with, with uh, <clears throat> prevention and, and clinical work is, is there an aspect of your problem that you are trying to, that you can easily quantify and you are trying to, in some ways, maximize that thing that you can quantify, right? So I don't think that this is, AI is going to be a better way of doing, say, trauma-informed therapy. Um, that's a much more interpersonal sort of experience. But if there's an aspect of your intervention that is something that is sort of systemic or systematic, then AI could be really good. One way though that it could be really interesting for clinical interventions is when you have a set of clinical interventions and you have a set of people and you might be thinking about who's, who would be best served by the match with a certain therapy. So for example, I've got a friend who's starting to think this way about substance abuse treatment work. There's a number of different interventions for substance abuse in substance abuse treatment and what are the characteristics of people that might be, and can you learn from past data, who seemed to do best in what sorts of interventions? And then you could, as a clinician, you could recommend, hey, people with experiences like you tend to do best with CBT, let's try that. Or people who do, you know, do, who like you tend to do best with 12-step programs, let's try that. Um, so that is a way that you can think about uh, even clinical work interfacing here, but it's kind of, you're, you're kind of taking a little bit more of a macro perspective. It's not going to help you to do DBT or CBT or 12-step programs better. It's helping you make the choice of that intervention mode over another because we can quantify that. Um, so it's not a silver bullet, but it can do a lot of cool stuff. That's my, that's my, that's my, that's my tagline for this talk. It's not a silver bullet, but it can do cool stuff. If I can leave you with one thought, that would be it, I think. That's great. Thank you so much. And I, I, I Thank love you. that you express so well what social work can bring to this in terms of understanding the complexity of the data. And mm. I think the questions that we got showed that social work perspective and that kind of critical perspective and how important that is. So thanks. I mean, it's what we bring to the table, right? I mean, we're, we're critical thinkers about the world and that's, and that's, uh, and that's what we're, our role really needs to be in this space. And uh, so I look forward to more conversations. Uh, I know I got an hour with some one-on-one -on -one meetings, so I'm looking forward to that. And send me an email if you want to follow up with me and you're not part of those conversations. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.